Welcome to another episode of Demystifying the Fascia. I'm Dr. Ajim Shah. Here we are going to present about the types of fascia. What are the different types of fascia and how it is important to have that knowledge in our clinical practice. Types of fascia. Fascia can be simply and generally explained or can be divided into three superficial fascia, deep fascia, visceral, or parietal fascia. To understand superficial and deep fascia, it's better to have a session of the skin and muscle part. You can see the epidermis and dermis, which is the skin. And after that, you can see a lot of fat cells there. It's called the superficial adipose tissue or SAG, superficial adipose tissue. After that, you can see a small or thinner layer of fascia, white one. This is called a superficial fascia. After that, again, you can see yellow color. That is, again, the fat deposition. It is called the DAT, deep adipose tissue. And again, after that, you can see the deep fascia see the deep fascia after the deep fascia you can see the muscles and muscles also combine epimysium and domysium perimysium the partial derivatives and there is two more structures i want to introduce the ligament this one okay this one actually the function of this ligament is to prevent excessive sliding or moving away of the skin of our superficial fascia and this is called retinaculum cutis superficialis there is another ligament, the same function is there between the superficial fascia and the deep fascia and this is called retinaculum cutis profundus. So there are two more structures I want to introduce is retinaculum cutis superficialis and this is retinaculum cutis profundus. Okay. The same structure we are having an electron microscopic structure, you can see here it's a skin, then you can see the superficial adipose tissue. You can see the ligaments of retinaculum cutis, superficial is in between. After that, you can see the superficial fascia. This is a superficial fascia. And after the superficial fascia, again, you can see a lot of flat. This is called a deep adipose tissue. After the deep adipose tissue, in between, you can see the retinaculum cutis profundus. Okay. After that, you can see the deep fascia. Where is the deep fascia? This is the deep fascia. Okay. And again, going to the internal organs, uh, the fascia is divided into visceral fascia and parietal fascia. You can see the visceral fascia and parietal fascia. Uh, you might have heard about visceral peritoneum, parietal peritoneum, the same and different. Generally, we used to call it as visceral fascia and parietal fascia. The superficial fascia directly underlies the skin. The fascia is associated mainly with the blood vessels, bones, nerves, and muscles. Okay, so wherever inside the body, the fascia is the main one, and the subsurus or visceral fascia is associated mainly with the internal organs. So this is the classifications of the fascial system. So uh, more into superficial fascia. It is found just underneath the skin, as we mentioned uh, earlier and stores fat and water and act as a passageway for lymph, nerve and blood vessels. Traditionally, it is described as being made of membranous layers with loosely packed interwoven collagen and elastic fibers. The specialty of the superficial fascia is any stretch of Superficial fascia is thicker in the trunk than in the limbs and becomes thinner peripherally. When you are moving out, for example, in your extremities, superficial fascia is thinner. A subtype of fascia in the abdomen is called scapa fascia. In some regions, the superficial fascia splits, forming special compartments around major subcutaneous veins and lymphatic vessels. In this way, it protects the vessels during movements and maintains the vessel up. So this is the superficial fascia. Okay, this is the superficial fascia of the neck. Okay, so this all gives you the picture of the uh, superficial fascia, which is more like a membranous one. 
having more stretchability and it is thicker in the trunk and thinner in the periphery. Let's discuss something about uh, superficial fascia with the uh, special functions. Okay. Superficial fascia layers uh, can sometimes include muscle fibers to create all types of structures of the body. A few examples of superficial fascia with the special functions include the platysma, the platysma, the SMAS of the face, then the external anal sphincter, and uh, that was fascia of the scrotum. That was fascia of the scrotum. So these are uh, superficial fascia which is having some specialized function so that they can contract. For example, platysma is the one which is actually when you are clenching the teeth, you can see the, the neck mass, skin mousse. The possible roles of the superficial fascia are, according to Stecco, the mobility of the skin with the respect to the deep lines. Okay, the protection of the superficial vessels and nerves, lymphatic drainage, uh, the separation between estroception and proprioception. Now into the deep fascia. Deep fascia is a relatively thick, dense and discrete fibrous tissue layer surrounds bones, muscles, nerves and blood vessels. It acts as a base for the superficial fascia and as an enclosure of muscle groups. The main function of the deep fascia is to support and protect muscles and other soft tissue structure including the internal organs. Deep fascia tends to be highly vascularized and contain well-developed lymphatic channels and contains a lot of free and encapsulated nerve endings. It shows aponeurotic features and it is very resistant to traction. So this is the aponeurosis, you can see the aponeurotic expansions, okay? Uh, and it presents different thickness according to the evaluated zones, okay? Where it is needed to be more, it is more thicker. A recent study by Welke says that, you know, like they have done the cadaveric study and by analyzing the fascia thickness, they found that the fascia is thicker uh, in the abdomen and lower extremities for younger population. And while it is thicker, uh, in the back, especially at thoracolumbar fascial area in the older age population. Now you can see uh, pectoralis fascia, which is a deep fascia. We have just removed or retracted the superficial fascia with the DAT, deep adipose tissue, to show the pectoral fascia. And you can see the pectoral fascia, everything is connected and continuous, you know. Pectoralis major fascia is continuous with the contralateral side. This is the sternum basically. So you cannot actually say that the fascia is specifically for an area. Everything is connected, right? The superficial fascia, thinner and uh, stretchable. The deep fascia is more thicker and thicker in the lower extremities too. The deep fascia means not only the fascia under the skin, at the superficial fascia, but also the fascia covering the muscles, the bones, the nerves, everything. So even uh, uh, you can say that deep fascia, deep fascia itself will be having different layers, superficial layer, middle layer, deep layer like that. So there will be a thin layer of loose connective tissue separates different layers of fascia. And just lines of collagen fibers show different organizations or orientations. So let's see, here you can see the collagen fiber orientation set in different directions in different layers of fascia. Let's say that this is the superficial part of the deep fascia. Maybe the collagen orientation is this direction. And the next to very next layer, you can see something which is in the opposite or 90 degree east to the this orientation so actually this orientation is based on the activities you know like the trouble in the bone that depends highly depends upon the activity if you are doing a particular type of activity the trouble clay will be trouble clay is nothing but a collagen deposition so that it reinforces the bone same like uh, there will be reinforcement of the fascia also 
the presence of loose connective tissue interposed between adjacent layers permits local sliding you know in this picture you can see that you know like this is the fascial layer layer 1 layer 2 because the collagen fiber orientation different across different fascia but ultimately if we are superimposing together you can see a multi layered tissue will be having uh, this the the uh, way venous in this way so thanks to the different orientations of the collagen fiber in the fascial layers the fascia has strong resistance to traction because of this even when it is uh, exercised in different uh, directions. So partial oriented training gives a lot of collagen depositions and it gives the waviness intact, which gives you the resilience or you know, ability to withstand the stress, ability to produce power and a lot. Like. Now let's go uh, quickly into the third type of fascia. It's a visceral fascia and parietal fascia. The visceral fascia surrounds organs in cavities like the abdomen, lung, and the heart. You know, uh, the lung it is called the pleura, and the heart it is called pericardium. And the parietal fascia is a general term for tissues that line the wall of a body cavity just outside of the parietal layer of the serosa. The most commonly known parietal fascia is found at the pelvis. Okay. Okay. Now, uh, let's have a quick look on uh, dysfunctions of the fascia and how it can affect in our body. When we are concerned about the superficial fascia, main issue is actually lymphedema. So, an alteration in the superficial fascia can cause lymphedema, but also that a patient with lymphedema probably has an alteration of the superficial fascia. Any treatment that involves the superficial fascia should improve the symptoms related to lymphedema. So, when you are treating a lymphedema, if you're a lymphedema therapist, you have to treat the superficial fascia also to get the optimum effect. Let's uh, see what is the relationship between fascia and the venous pathologies. The superficial fascia is strongly associated with the superficial veins. All the major superficial veins of the inferior limbs are enveloped by a splitting of the superficial fascia along their entire length. The strong anatomic relationship between the saphenous vein and the superficial fascia may have an important role both in daily clinical practice and in the pathophysiology of varicose veins. Thermoregulation and skin trophies. A fibrotic superficial fascia can restrict or choke the arteries inside it, including the flaxile thereby reducing the skin vascularization. If the arteriovenous shunts become deficient, an alteration of the thermoregulation may occur, resulting in sensations of excessively hot or cold skin. I have seen def defects in control of peripheral resistance lead to hypertension, orthostatic hypotension, Reynolds phenomenon, defective thermoregulation, hand foot syndrome, migraine, headaches, and congestive heart failures, first kind of scenarios. We are all saying that because the fascia is a continuous structure and the superficial fascia is entire, you know. So, you know, like if it is localized dysfunctions, the symptoms will be localized. If it is generalized symptoms, that means, you know, we can say that there is a partial dysfunction which is more generalized. So now we'll go to the disorders of the deep fascia. There are many, a lot of lists there, but you know, because of the time emission, we are just uh, mentioning few. The one of the thing is that actually uh, fascia and uh, chronic musculoskeletal pain. Sensitization of partial nocis subtors to mechanical and chemical stimuli may contribute to the pathophysiology of chronic musculoskeletal pain. In chronic low back pain, there is alteration in the histological uh, structure of the fascia and they have seen that the degree of innervation is also changed. Let's say that the free endings, instead of free endings, they have found there are a lot of nociceptive adapted type of uh, nerve endings. Another study says that you know, in growth of nociceptive fibers and the immunoreaction to substance P, 
inflammatory neurotransmitter. Inter in the lateral neurotransmitter in patients with the patellar femoral alignments. So whenever there is a chronic pain, you can see there is no cystic growth. Many of the studies I showed you the sliding capacity of the facial layers reduces when there is an inflammation comes. And uh, on a further study uh, by Stecco says that you know the correlation between uh, a decrease in range of movement in, uh, in the neck and uh, a deep uh, fascia thickness. So they found by ultrasound that, you know, uh, those who are having chronic neck pain, there is actually facial thickness has improved. Sorry, facial thickness has increased. When a person who is active, young and active, the fascia is actually more baby, as I mentioned earlier, more springy. It can produce more resilience power, but somebody who's older, less active, or the the muscles or any part which is immobilized after fracture, the fascia looks like it's going to be more uh, less organized collagen deposition which affect the fascia slide. Okay, so the crimp angle is nothing but the angle produced by the baby appearance of the fascia and which is actually mentioned as you know the, the ability of the fascia to have the shock absorption or resilience of the fascia. So fascia and the peripheral motor coordination, we are more uh, explaining about epipedia and endomysiums in this session. The epimysial fascia plays a key role in proprioception or joint position sense and peripheral motor coordination due to their close relationships with the muscle spindles. Indeed, the muscle spindles are localized in the perimysium and their capsule connects to the epimysium and fascial septum. If epimysial fascia is overstretched, the muscle spindle connected to this portion of the fascia also stretched and overactivated. This implies that the associated muscle fibers will be constantly stimulated to contract or not relax. This could explain the increased amount of acetylcholine found in the myofascial pain and in particular in trigger points. This passive stretch situation could be responsible for muscular imbalances and recurrent cramps and could result in incorrect movement patterns or joints. If the epimysial fascia is densified or thickens, some parts of the muscle will not function normally during the movement, causing an unbalanced movement of the joint with the results in uncoordinated movement and eventually joint pain. Thus, the epimysial fascia could be considered as a key element in peripheral motor coordination. So just giving a refresh and recall, symptoms related to dysfunction of the lymphatic system, superficial vein system, and regulatory system are more related to disorders of the superficial fascia. Dysfunctions such as alteration in mechanical coordination, proprioception, balance, myofascial pain and cramps are more related to fascia and epimysium. The fascia and the epimysium. Thank you again uh, for any queries. If you want to listen to any topics, please mail at fasciadr at gmail.com session will be on the types of cells of the fascia. So what are the fascial cells and what are the functions that will be our next video. So till then, bye bye.